Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Jakarta Tech Talk. My name is Samantha, and joining us today is Ali Ok. Ali works on the Native Project for Red Hat with a strong focus on event-driven aspects. He is an approver in multiple Native modules, including the Clore Eventing module. He experienced with many other emerging technologies in his free time. If you have any questions for Ali as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask it in the chat or use the Ask a Question tab. Without any further delay, Ali, over to you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen already, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ali. I work for Red Hat. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I'm working on Knative eventing. Um, so Knative, uh, today I will actually talk a lot about Knative and uh, how you can use it in your Java um, workloads, basically. I'm an Apache committer since 2010. I was uh, initially uh, working uh, on a project called MyFaces I've seen some people uh, from the My Faces community uh, that, that uh, who attended uh, the the talk, and it made me actually really happy. Uh, and I live in Istanbul, in Turkey. So I will talk about Knative. I will also talk about Quarkus. Uh, I mean, these are really big subjects, so um, I will briefly uh, touch on both to give you an idea what these are. And I also have a Demo. Um, so, Knative is about serverless on Kubernetes, but you know how the ev evolution of the uh, sort of software architectures happen. So, <clears throat> uh, initially we had the good, good old monoliths, but they weren't very efficient. You couldn't scale them, uh, and you couldn't utilize your resources better. So we needed to uh, break them into smaller parts. And then came microservices and containers along with it. And then all these containers needed orchestration and then you needed Kubernetes. And eventually now we have serverless uh, on Kubernetes with Knative. Uh, serverless is already um, a concept that is known since many years, uh, but outside of the Kubernetes area. <clears throat> what I'm going to show you is serverless on Kubernetes. OK, so what is Knative? It's a Kubernetes-based platform to deploy and manage modern serverless workloads. That means it is running on Kubernetes, and it runs on any Kubernetes, no vendor lock-in. Uh, that means uh, if you have a private cloud or if you run your things workload on public cloud, you can run, you can use, you can make use of Knative on your workload. And another good thing is you can still use your uh, existing Kubernetes uh, resources like deployments and replica sets and whatever you have. So if you switch to Kubernetes, if you install Kubernetes, uh, sorry, if you install Knative, you don't have to uh, switch everything. You don't have to go all the way. You just need, uh, you can just use Knative uh, wherever it's needed. And uh, for, for example, this makes sense if you have some legacy applications that you want to um, switch to uh, migrate to Knative. So you can do it step by step. And Knative is not just functions like um, the serverless as we know it um, uh, because of basically this. So it's still leveraging all the Kubernetes primitives. So um, not just functions, stateless functions. Um, so Knative has two modules. The first one is serving. It is basically to run your applications and as pods and provide scaling and networking and etc. And eventing is about managing your events and basically having um, 
um, something like event-driven architectures. Both modules can run standalone, but it's better if you use them together. So Knative is a ser Knative serving module uh, provides the most known feature of it is auto scaling and it does auto scaling with scale to zero. So whenever there's a <clears throat> peak in your load, it just scales to uh, even hundreds of pods. If there is nothing, it scales down to zero. Um, and it also provides advanced networking. networking. So it's not just about um, like scaling parts. It's also about networking, as in you can create revisions, you can do uh, traffic splitting and things like that. So that means when you have a Knative serving service, um, you can you can do things like uh, canary deployments and AB deployments and things like that, green blue deployments and things like that. So just have some part of the uh, some uh, some part of the requests, some portion of the requests going to a specific version uh, of your uh, workload. And it provides immutable revisions. So that means uh, it's very easy to roll back to a previous revision. If you have, uh, if you found out there is something wrong with the new revision, new version of the Knative service, which is your application. So you can just do go back to the previous ver uh, revision and it will, uh, Knative serving will actually, what it will do is <clears throat> it will, um, it will not only revert the, the uh, images for the container, it will also revert everything like the environment variables, configs, and things like that to a to the previous revision. And it has some simplifications. These could be also thought as kind of limitations, but these are done to make things simpler and also uh, making the entire model uh, more more sensible. So the thing is, uh, you can only have a single port exposed so that Knative serving will, you know, it will monitor actually that port, the request coming to this uh, pod on that port, and it will scale down based, number, uh, based on the number of requests. You cannot have persistent volumes. Uh, when I prepared slide, this slide, actually, there were no persistent volume support. Now there is. Um, so this is not an issue anymore. Uh, of course, there are some limitations. Um, and you can only run single containers. I will uh, also talk about Knative eventing. So um, Knative eventing is about running your serverless workloads and with event-driven architecture. What that means is uh, similar to requests that are coming to uh, like in Knative serving, uh, the auto scaling happens based number uh, based uh, on number of requests like HTTP requests. Here, it is very similar, but here the requests are more like events. So, uh, for example, you can get events from your Kafka topic, and then if there are just too many events or messages uh, in the Kafka topic, then you scale uh, up your um, application based on the load on the or back pressure or whatever it's called uh, on the Kafka topic. So it consists of a core system. So there are some primitives like subscriptions, channels, um, things like that. Uh, but there are also uh, additional components um, that are plug and play um, that, that, are, that are designed in a plug and play way. Uh, so for example, you can have event sources for Kafka channel, as well as um, some other technology. Like I, I remember there were um, older channels which were even uh, doing things like uh, WebSocket channel and things like that. So for I will talk about example channels later in the slides. 
Um, so these are like the building blocks. Um, so we have sources, channels, subscriptions, broker, etc. I will talk about these uh, in a moment. But to start with, let's take the simplest one, which is the source. So what a Knative source does is it gets a message from a message origin, such as Apache Kafka, the Kubernetes API server itself, AWS SQS, GitHub, or pretty much any container you have. So you can have your kind of legacy containers um, acting like event sources, or the source is getting can, can get uh, events from, from your legacy containers. And what it does is the source converts the original uh, origin specific event to a cloud event. So a cloud event is something that is used in the uh, key native. There is a specification about that. So um, we will see examples of a cloud, what, what, what a cloud event looks like. So what a source does is <clears throat> basically then, again, uh, converting the origin specific event into a cloud event and send the event to its sync. And we have actually all these uh, sources in the Knative community. We have an Apache Kafka source. We have Kubernetes API server source, AWS SQS source, GitHub source, a um, bunch of other sources. For example, um, the Apache Kafka source is useful if you want to uh, read messages from the Kafka topic. And if there are too many messages, then you can scale up your application that is processing uh, the events from uh, or messages from your Kafka topic. Similarly, uh, we have Kubernetes API server source, for example. What it does is uh, using this, you can listen to the uh, Kubernetes API server events, such as um, a, a new pod is created or a node is down and things like that. And you can get events to your application, and then you can do something about it. Maybe send an alert, maybe do something else. Um, so AWS SQS is very similar to Apache Kafka in in a, in a sense that it you just receive messages or uh, yeah messages from it, and then you take the messages into the uh, event pop pipeline that you can create with Knative components. Um, yeah, GitHub is also another example. So uh, what you have, what, what you can have here is you can, um, I don't remember if it's actually doing poll or a push. Um, like uh, if there is a webhook or if it's po pulling, uh, polling. Either way, what source does is it gets your messages, like there's a PR created and or there's a new repo created, some comment added something from GitHub and then it creates it to, it converts it to a cloud event. And then that way you can use this event in your pipeline. So yeah, this is the very simple example. I will actually demo this one exactly. Um, the message origin um, sends the event to source or the source pulls the event from message origin and then uh, it converts it to cloud event and eventually sends it to a sync. So what a sync is, I mean, in eventing or in messaging uh, terminology, sync is basically something you send messages to. Um, and here in Knative, we have example syncs. Uh, a Knative service can be um, a, a sync. So the Knative sources like Kafka source, for example, can get messages from the topic and then it can send it to the sync. Uh, the good thing is, uh, so these are all plug and play, uh, no, sorry, not all, but there are also plug and play key native syncs. Like there is a sync for uh, Kafka, there is a sync for Redis. That means um, what, what plug and play here means is you don't have to write any code to send events to a Kafka topic or to Redis. Uh, you just use the existing uh, things that are provided to you. Um, another example, sync could be a Knative channel. I will talk about channels later. Uh, to emphasize again on the Knative service, 
um, so um, your service is basically so a K native service is basically something you write and it's your application it's your code so if you just use this application K native service uh, as your sync that means you will write your own code to process uh, the events that are coming from the source um, so before um, going more detail into Knative, because there are other stuff like channels and brokers and things like that, I also want to talk about Quarkus. Um, so Quarkus is a um, stack, basically. It's a Kubernetes native Java stack that is tailored for OpenJDK hotspot and GraalVM crafted from the uh, best Java libraries and standards. So that means it's it has the best suite of Java libraries and standards. It's Kubernetes native. Uh, it's a Java stack. Uh, it has lots of stuff like um, it is Eclipse MicroProfile compatible, um, using all the um, GraalVM and all the new uh, technologies in the Java ecosystem. It uses a low, low memory and disk, and it starts really fast. And yeah, again, with GraalVM, uh, even without GraalVM, it starts pretty fast and it uses less disk and memory. But with GraalVM, uh, you can create a binary and you can uh, actually create even, um, you can make use of even lower resource usages. So a Quarkus application is basically your typical uh, Maven application. You define a dependency to um, to Quarkus uh, artifacts. Here we have Quarkus Hibernate Validator. When you define this, you just use your standard stuff like uh, Javax validation, and I will also show other stuff. Um, or the one I used in my example, in my demo, is very simple uh, Jax RS application. So this is simple. This is a simple greeting resource. It uses all the small, uh, all the nice stuff from MicroProfile and uh, Jax RS, and it's a pretty standard thing. So you don't have to. Um, there are some caveats, but you don't have to write something special for Quarkus. <coughs> um, so I will show a little bit more code in my demo about Quarkus. Um, but so here is my demo. What I will do is I have a message producer here, which is um, so all of these is, all of these are running on Kubernetes. Um, I have uh, this message producer. It creates events um, like twenty thousand messages. Uh, it writes them into a Kafka cluster, so a topic, and the Kafka source um, will get the messages from the Kafka topic and it will actually send them uh, to the sync, which is my custom application here. And yeah, this is the URL for the demo. Um, yep. Oh, come on. IntelliJ is showing me the, yeah, okay. Okay, so I have the message generator here. This is not a Java application. This is not really relevant here. I just want, I just needed something uh, to send bunch of events to a Kafka topic, bunch of messages to a Kafka topic. So I'll just skip that one for now. Well, what you need to know about this is um, you just give this uh, container, the a container and image built from this application. You just give this uh, a URL and it will send to 20,000 messages. And the other thing, the other custom application I wrote is this message sync. So this is actually a Quarkus application. So you can see the Maven uh, file, POM file. Um, there is not something strange here. It's all like the stuff 
you know um, so but they are kind of tailored um, and the only code the only uh, endpoint the rest endpoint I have here is this greeting, greeting resource um, so again from the previous from the slides you can see these are the standard things that I use here nothing strange and there is this greeting resource that is handling this path um, and this is the this is my um, like uh, uh, request handler so it's a accepting posts it's producing JSON it consumes everything and what it does is it just gets the headers it iterates over the headers and then it writes the body so to um, so it writes the headers and the body to the standard output um, yeah this is really it like I mean it's a really simple Quarkus application um, it starts I'll show it will it, it starts really fast which is really important it uses the uh, low uh, memory and uh, low disk um, so it has low disk requirements, which is really good, which is what we need in cloud, in Kubernetes. So let's build this thing. Okay, I'm already here in the, uh, in the message sync application. Let me do this. Oh, okay. So all the stuff you know, home, and the only strange thing, or not the strange, but the only uh, different thing is that I have this greeting resource. Now to build this, I have some notes somewhere. Let me bring that up. Yeah. So what I can do is I can write, just run this command, uh, compile, and then park as dev. So this is doing the typical uh, compile and then it will start a server and yeah it it's uh, it's running already and let me send an event actually a sample cloud event I don't have to send the cloud event but I just wanted to uh, what it does is it just it writes over headers and it also uh, writes the body response body to the output. Uh, so this is my simple uh, curl, which I have some headers and a uh, body for the request. So, I mean, this is a very simple application. What I actually want to show is more interesting stuff, like what you can do with, um, like there is hot reloading and things like that. Let me also show you that one. I forgot. Okay, so let's run the same thing again. Yeah, and I'll see headers, body, and things like that. So let's go into the code and change headers to headers two and then save. Does it actually save? Yeah. Nah, it didn't work because my ID is not really saving, I think. Yeah, okay, I will skip that one. Sorry about that. Um, so the next thing is what I can do with uh, this command is... Oh, sorry, I got no okay. Ali, we do happen to have a question in the chat, which says, how do you know it consumes low memory? Is there an observability tool built in to capture this? Um, there is no, uh, well, what I can see is I will also show you about that. I will show uh, the memory usage directly on the operating system level for simplicity. Um, I think you can, make use of existing uh, observability tools 
and you can have, I'm pretty sure there is some plugin for memory usage and things like that, Orcus plugin that exposes um, memory usage and other things that you can capture them in a central location and have a look. But I will not show you about this, but I will show what I will show is I will show uh, the memory usage uh, directly on the operating system here on my machine. Why blocking uh, used at consumer code? Um, good question. I don't remember. <clears throat> I, I prepared this some time ago. Let's delete it if you like and see what happens. Oops. Yeah, nothing. So I think I copy pasted that part. And yeah, you know, normally with all these new uh, NIO um, systems, what you can do is you can do things non-blocking, but I'm not 100% sure. OK. So the other thing I will show you is building the native uh, executable for this Quarkus application. So this takes actually some time, like 30 seconds or something, maybe more, since I'm now sharing my screen. Uh, what it does is um, it uses the Growl, uh, Growl VM to create the uh, native binary and then you can just run the binary and you will have the same application running so this is more useful because this is optimized in a way that it uses less resources uh, and yeah um, it is more efficient and it start it starts faster um, also if you don't have uh, so this on if you want to try uh, there are instructions in the de in the demo readme file um, so this command is basically building the native directly on my machine but there is also um, a uh, there's also another command that I put there when you run it you don't have to install growl VM on your machine but you just use the growl VM in a container. Okay, this is taking longer than I thought. So let me show you the uh, command at least. Yeah, uh, container build. So it builds the same thing, the same binary, but using a container. Um, so we don't have to install GraalVM. Yeah, OK, finally finished. So now when I check target, I can see there is a file called message sync runner. It's a, uh, let's check, it's a, it's a 44 megabyte application. And if you run it, you'll see the same thing. So it's the same Quarkus application, and it will produce the same uh, output. So this is more useful uh, because let's do this. So I have very simple command to um, simple way of yeah. Let me do that. 
So what I do is I first print the date and then I run the uh, application. So we can have some kind of feeling of how fast it starts. It's not the best measurement tool, I know. But I mean, if you check this time and then this time when it was ready, you can see it's like really milliseconds and it's again, yeah, running. And the memory usage, let me also show you that one. Um, maybe do it here. So this is the PS command with which shows the RSS. The uh, yeah, these are complicated concepts. Again, this is not like hundred percent accurate, but what my PS command shows me is this application is using eighteen megabytes of RAM, which is something when you think about a Java application. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I just showed you about the um, the part about like how to build your Corcus application and things like that, and it's running really fast. It um, it's using less memory and things like that. But now um, uh, let's actually run this application in a container. So um, in my demo, I have these folders. Uh, there is this, as I showed you, message generator, which is a node application, not relevant message thing, is the just the application that I just built. I also built an image for that, and I pushed it to uh, to the um, Docker Hub. So I will just use that. And if you check the config folder, there are files like these. So the first one is actually just creating the namespace. The second one is creating the sync. The third one is creating the topic. Uh, so the namespace is, yeah, the namespace, the sync is actually my message sync application here. So the second file will create this one. Um, yeah, let me maybe first run them. So I just create the namespace and then the sync. Uh, when I create the sync, I will see some pods on my namespace because uh, I created basically a Knative service. And when you create a Knative service, it will start running immediately. Uh, it doesn't, it won't wait until there's load or something. But after some time, uh, I don't know how much, maybe 60 seconds or something, uh, if there's no load, it will, I mean, this, that is the default uh, timeout. If, if there is no load, then it will scale down the deployment, so the pods, the, uh, the service. And then there is a topic, a Kafka topic that I will send messages to. And then there is this source. If you check the source, this is the source, so it gets the events from Kafka cluster, and then it will send it to uh, the sync. When I apply this, the only piece that I didn't apply, that I didn't create basically, will be the message producer. So I will just do that uh, as a last step. Okay. So my Kafka source pod is created. So the Kafka source pod is running always to you know, to check if there are any messages. But my sync, my Knative service, is scaled down because there were no uh, requests. Um, and let me do some additional things here. So I will use this turn command, which is <clears throat> basically uh, to, it's following the logs for the sync application. Yeah. So. Shut down, complete, exiting. Yeah, there are no Knative service pods anymore for my application. And I will also turn, I will also follow the logs for message generator, which I will just create. So when I hit enter, yeah, so this message generator starts sending 20,000 messages to, to the Kafka topic. And here you can see my K 
native service is scaled up to, I don't know, 10, yeah, 10 uh, pods. Because there are too many messages, there are too many requests from uh, the Kafka source to the sync. It actually, the KK native serving scales this uh, sync service uh, up to 10 pods. And now messages are all sent. And these are my logs. Again, for the sync application, different sync pods. Um, like, I mean, they're like intercepting, like they're mixed because there are different containers. There are, there are different pods here. Again, the same application that, that I just showed you, body and um, headers. So if you wait like 60 seconds, we will start seeing uh, these going down. Yeah, they're already being terminated. So that was basically it about the demo. Um, so I'll share the link for the presentation where you can find the demo, uh, link to the demo here. Um, OK, so again, this is the source to sync scenario. And there are also other <clears throat> um, constructs in Knative eventing. One of them is a channel. Channel is a bit, uh, I mean, channel is different than source. What channel does is it lives in, and again, in the Knative eventing system. Uh, when you send events to it, it provides fan out and basically <clears throat> something like pops up. Um, so when you send these two events, one and two, to the channel, uh, and you also need to create subscriptions, like subscription uh, resources that defines something like this. I am subscribed to these events on this channel. Um, and please send the events to this sync. So what channel will do is it will send these events to the sinks. Example channels are in-memory channels, uh, which are not really um, which is they, they shouldn't be used in uh, in production loads, but they're useful for testing stuff. Um, and again, Apache Kafka channel. So when you send an event to a Apache Kafka channel, the event is sent to Apache Kafka first, and then it will retrieve again from uh, Apache Kafka. What this provides is um, persistence, first of all. So if your channel or if your sinks or something in between are down, if they crash, you will still have your uh, events there. Um, and the second part is uh, if you are producing way faster than you consume, uh, using, <clears throat> using a channel will help you synchronize um, you know, your, your processing. Uh, what I mean is uh, if you send thousand messages to a Kafka topic in a second. And if you process only 100 a second in your sinks, what you can do is you can scale up. But if you're using, uh, if you decide you're using too many resources, then you can limit the scale up. That's also a feature in Knative uh, serving, for example. Um, and you can say, like, I want to only use five, uh, uh, five replicas then there will be <clears throat> a huge difference between your producing speed and uh, consuming speed, like hundreds, uh, sorry, 1,000 messages per second versus five, uh, 500 messages per second. Um, so normally, you cannot, your application, typically, if you send them directly, uh, they won't, they cannot handle it. But what channel does is you send just, you just send the messages to channel, and channel um, works in a way like it makes sure that the uh, sync uh, processed the messages it sends. So it just sends like sequentially. Um, so this helps with the synchronization. Um, yeah, another example channel is the GCP, the Google um, Cloud pops up. Um, yeah, so for example, this is called publish subscribe channel in the book. 
called Enterprise Integration Patterns, which is a kind of known book for doing messaging and integration and things like that. Uh, so what, how you can do this with Kai Native is using channels. Like um, if you have for here, we have two different message origins. The one, the first message origin is outside your Kubernetes cluster. And the second one is living inside your Kubernetes cluster. This could be your legacy application or something. And this could be your message origin, uh, sorry, your, um, your um, external service. Um, and these send events to um, your channel. Uh, the, ex the external message uh, origin, uh, it cannot send an event to channel directly. So you, you would need a source to convert that event to a cloud event. But if you're in cluster application or uh, a, another Knative uh, source that is living in your Kubernetes cluster, if that is producing uh, cloud winds, it can directly talk to uh, the channel. So channel collects all these messages and delivers them to different syncs by uh, subscription. And okay, the um, next one, the next kind of primitive in Knet or the building block, I should say, in Knet eventing is called broker. Broker is pretty much, uh, it, it's very similar to a channel except it provides uh, more advanced filtering. Uh, so what it means is with this filtering, you can uh, think of this broker like a kind of message bus or a regular broker that you can rely on sending events and loosely coupling or decoupling things. Um, so again, if you check the book, Enterprise Inter Integration Patterns book, uh, this is kind of uh, mentioned as content-based router. Uh, you have different sources here. They send different kind of events. So uh, events green, events blue. Like first one could be a GitHub event. And the second one could be a Kafka uh, event, Apache Kafka event. So the broker collects them. And then uh, here, very similar to subscriptions before, you create triggers. And in triggers, uh, you define what kind of events you like to get delivered to the syncs you define. Uh, like with this trigger, I say we only need, we only want the green events, like GitHub events, and then this sync will only get GitHub events. Similar story here. Um, so there are also other things like uh, plugins. So these are like plug and play components, what I mentioned. Uh, there are also other plug and play components like syncs. And there is also something called sequence, a parallel. Sequence is basically to pipe to uh, services, for example, Knative event, uh, Knative serving services, so that the first one produces something and it becomes an input to the next one. Um, and you don't, your application, uh, which like in your code or somewhere, <clears throat> you don't have to define the URL of the second one. So it's providing some kind of bounding or binding. Um, a parallel is similar. So when you send something to a parallel, it will make sure these are sent to different uh, channels. So it's again, only pen out. Um, so one example thing that I will show you because I will I hear a lot about ML, uh, ML and um, what you can do with Knative. So this is like a typical ML pod pipeline. I'm not an expert in this. I just know there is the collection phase. You receive you get uh, events or data basically from different clients. It could be Twitter. It could be your IoT device. It could be whatever. And then you ingest these data, you store them somewhere, and then you prepare these data. <clears throat> like you remove some stuff, you make them um, comply to a common format or something like that. And then you do the computation on them. And then eventually when you do the comp uh, computation, you store the final result, result somewhere, and then you can um, do a presentation, like you can show a graph, 
you can send an email, you can uh, send an alert if there is something that needs to be taken care of. So this is like a typical pipeline. And this could be how you can do this with Knative. So here I have three clients. The first one is talking to <coughs> Kafka directly. Excuse me. And the second one is talking uh, REST, talking to a REST endpoint. And the third one is talking M MQTT. These two REST and MQTT endpoints, they can also send uh, their um, messages to a Kafka topic. And then with Kafka source, you can get the um, messages or events from the Kafka topic, and then you can send them to a Knative sequence where you do the data preparation. Like the Knative service one, it can do something, maybe it can remove some fields or you know, it can apply some kind of transform. And the second service, it can do another kind of transform. And then eventually the output of the sequence could be sent to Kafka using a Kafka sync. And then from Kafka, you can have your presentation with like, dashboard or you can send emails. Maybe there is a, there you could use another application here, which is not really relevant for this example. But the good point is this. So if I switch to the next slide, um, you can see everything stays the same, like the applications, the code I wrote, for example, for clients or for this uh, transformation uh, applications, they're the same. So if I switch from, if I want to switch from Kafka to Google Cloud Storage or some, you know, some other technology, um, then what I would use here is instead of uh, Kafka, I would send my uh, data to Google Cloud Storage, and then there is a source for that which I can make use of, and then eventually, I think I don't know if there is actually a plug and play sync for uh, Google Cloud Storage, but you can use one of the things, or you can just write a small application here, which sends events to the target system you want. So this is what I mean by plug and play components. We already have Kafka source, we already have Knative sequence, we already have Kafka sync. So you will not write any code for these. You will only write your own uh, own logic. And there is no vendor login, as in you can run Knative on any Kubernetes uh, distribution. And also there is no vendor login when it comes to like integration. So if you use Kafka here, you can also make use of other uh, plug and play components or other um, messaging systems or any other um, services. So these are my kind of takeaways. Knative provides better workload management. Um, there are also a lot of features, especially in serving, um, uh, like these, the things I mentioned about traffic splitting, doing uh, experimental deployments and things like that. Um, so all these good stuff on top of being able to scale dynamically, including zero. Um, and Quarkus is leveraging the existing Java ecosystem with all these standards and uh, with compliance to a bunch of uh, standards. Um, and it is actually pretty good for serverless, what we need for serverless. It is uh, super fast. It's running, uh, it's starting up real, real fast. It's using very minimal um, resources. So that's it. And you can reach me out on Twitter at this handle. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer.